Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. I'm going to talk about a, a physicist's approach to a medical problem. And I want to be clear about something. I am not a medical doctor. Some of you may remember the radio comedian who called himself Dr. Science. Um, I'm not a real doctor. <laughs> I have a degree in science. Um, and uh, I'm going to try to tell you about in some sense, about unique perspectives, unique perspectives that you can get on problems when you intrude on somebody else's turf, when you go into somebody else's territory, you sometimes can do some good. And that's the idea, that's the idea of a physicist working on this uh, terrible medical problem of brain tumors. And that's what I'm gonna try to tell you about. Now, I want to uh, talk about my collaborators. There are some students and postdocs at the top, but I look at the, the collection of collaborators I have. Um, uh, Nino Kioka is the head of neurosurgery at OSU, and there are cell biologists and another, another medical doctor who's a medical researcher also. So um, it's a multidisciplinary team, and that's the thing I'm going to try to focus on. What can you get? What can you get out of looking at a specific problem, a specific problem, when you have a big team like this which, who cross disciplines, and let me make this specific. I am a theoretical physicist, and that's the way I approach problems, pattern formation problems, biophysics problems like this one, and I'm going to try to, try to bring a perspective which I hope is useful. Now, I want to make a distinction which is sort of a, a nitpicking distinction, but it's important that we understand for some, for that um, there is something called um, cross-disciplinary uh, science. Cross-disciplinary science is not the whole answer to problems. Of course, experts have to, have to actually deal with the areas of their expertise. But um, there are good things you get from cross-disciplinary science. For example, ideas from outside are new to experts, and they may be interesting. And you may inspire new experiments, new techniques. That's the upside of this kind of work. The downside of this kind of work is that experts aren't sometimes not interested in being told what to do. And um, most researchers are plenty happy with what they're doing already, and they don't want to do something. But that, we, we, we deal with that. And there's a way you deal with that. The way you deal with that is you belong to a team. Okay? You have to work with people who actually are experts and know what they're talking about. So um, that's what I've done in this, this project, which has actually wound up uh, this year. Okay, so um, it's, it's uh, as we'll see, it's, it's a little bit of a hard slog sometimes to get people to listen to new ideas in any field. Now, um, I want to say one more thing before I plunge in. Um, some of you may know the term uh, biophysics. This is not, what I'm going to talk about is not biophysics, at least not in the way that most people think of the term. Ordinary biophysics uh, mostly means using the techniques of physics on biological problems. And so there are things that physicists have invented, like X-ray diffraction, which allows you to unwind uh, untangle the structure of DNA, or uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which allows you to have MRI imaging. Those things are wonderful, wonderful advances, but that's not so much, that's not so much bringing ideas from physics as bringing techniques. Um, I'm, I'm a theoretical physicist. I don't know how to do experiments, so it, it, it wouldn't do any good. It wouldn't do any good if I were to tell people about experiments. And um, so I'm going to be talking about something which is called biological physics, where we try to use our, the concepts from physics rather than the techniques of physics so much. And um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about malignant brain tumors. Now, malignant brain tumors are a rather depressing subject. And I thank for all of you coming out on a Saturday morning to hear about this. Um, 
it, it, is, it is really um, a, terrible, a terrible disease that I'm going to talk about. Um, 18,000 people a year are diagnosed with primary brain tumors in this country. Uh, 9,000 of them have the worst kind, which is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, a, a recent a famous example is Ted Kennedy, who has exactly this, this disease. Um, and um, it's a, the statistics are very, very gloomy indeed. And um, I'm what we're going to try to figure out, what we're going to try to figure out is why that is. Hmm? And I'm not going to present anything which is even remotely a cure, of course. But I'm going to try to give some perspective on why this disease is so terrible and why it's so hard to deal with. Um, and th th this is a remarkable fact. In the last 30 years, there have been basically no advances in this disease, whereas almost all other cancers there have been. And that's sort of sad and remarkable. So why that? Well, here is a picture of a uh, patient who died of uh, glioma. This is from the laboratory, uh, from the, the practice of my friend Kyoka, um, who this is an MRI image of the tumor. This is what you can see on an image. And that's, that's a brain tumor. And they took it out. Now, Nino is a very good surgeon. And he was not being sloppy when he took this much. A huge bunch of, of brain tissue was taken, much bigger than the tumor you could see. And the reason for that is what is sort of the subject of this talk. Um, and the, what happened was, you see here's the, the, the place that was excised and filled with saline solution. It just left there. Um, there's a new tumor right there after eight months, and this guy died in a year. Now, this is what happens to this tumor. This kind of disease always spreads. It always spreads because there are, it is, as, as they say, invasive. Cancer cells leave the tumor and move to other parts of the brain. OK? Um, the secondary tumors are formed. The invasive cells proliferate slowly and are hard to kill by normal, normal techniques that, are, that um, attack cancer. Cancer cells are killed by radiation, for example, because they proliferate. And during proliferation, the DNA is fragile and can be disrupted by radiation. But these, these guys, are when they're running around, don't proliferate very much. They may be related to something which you may have re read about, um, cancer stem cells, which do not proliferate very much, but are absolutely essential in all tumors. That's not clear in this case. But um, it is in, other, in the case of other tumors, invasive cells are cancer stem cells. But, um, and so you have a, a real problem, a real problem. And what I'm going to try to, um, try to understand is how they move. Uh, that's what physicists do, is we understand motion, dynamics, how things develop. And that's what this, is, this talk is about, what we can learn about these cells moving around within the brain. Now, let me say a few things about this. Uh, this is not the same as metastasis. Metastasis is pit, bits of a tumor by a special mechanism getting into the blood and then running around throughout the body. That's not what we're talking about. Uh, for reasons which are not clear, at least, at least not clear to me, that seldom happens or never happens with these brain tumors. Unfortunately, the tumor is already in the worst possible place. And um, these cells move around sometimes on the outside of blood vessels. They move around in, you know, along nerve sheaths. They will move very quickly in the white matter of the brain, which is collections of, as it were, cables between the, the uh, computing parts of the, of the brain. And um, that motion is in the extracellular matrix, so the part, the connective tissue that holds together, that holds together the brain. Hmm? And in fact, the, these particular cells seldom go to the cortex where the neurons are. They, they're inside in the, in the, the, the glia. So uh, that's what we were trying to figure out. OK, so how they invade, how they move, is what I'm going to be talking about. And um, maybe someone else, not me because I'm not a medical doctor, could uh, try to suppress invasion and see if that might help dealing with this disorder. OK, so uh, let's see an, uh, some examples. Now, how do you study these cells that, they, that move? Well, you can get these cells, alas, all too easily. And you can do various things with them. You can put them in this kind of gadget where you put them in a, one side of a chamber and they crawl through to the other side. And you can see them moving. Or you can actually watch them moving. 
uh, this way by just putting them down on a, on a dish, and this is time-lapse photograph. They move really, really enormously fast for cells, 20 microns per hour. Of course, it's a very slow speed by our standards, but they don't have to go very far. If you put a tumor in a transgenic mouse, in a few weeks, the cells move from one side of the brain to the other. You know, because they really move. Uh, you can study mice, or you can study the brain itself. And none of these are going to be the approach that I, we're going to take. I want you to notice what these cells look like. When cells uh, move, they put out long processes called phyllopods, which attach onto something and, and pull. So cells walk. Okay? They walk around, and, they, and as we'll see, they're walking around in kind of a jungle of connective tissue. And it's the motion of those things walking in the connective tissue that we're going to be talking about. OK, so here's, our, uh, here's a schematic of the kind of experiment which we use. Uh, other people have used it. Um, you have a little one centimeter well um, of plexiglass, and you put in a clump of tumor cells called the tumor spheroid, which are harvested from a, uh, a patient or from a mouse or somewhere and kept alive in a, in a solution. And they make this, these little clumps when they have nothing to grow on. And then you drop them into this gel. And you contrive to have this gel solidify so that the tumor spheroid is suspended, suspended off of the bottom so you can see in three dimensions. Now, I asked the people who did the experiments. There was this Japanese postdoc who was really a, a very, very fine uh, researcher. I asked him, how do you contrive to get the gel to gel before this thing falls to the bottom? And he said, it is very difficult. <laughs> and that's all I ever got out of him. <laughs> OK, what the advantage, the advantage of this, the advantage of this method is that you can uh, just take pictures. This is an ordinary light microscope picture called a bright field image. Where you just, this is the tumor spheroid, and these are the invasive cells. This is a particular cell line. This is work by one of my collaborators before the, I started working with him about this, particular, about this particular method. And the two things that happen is that this thing grows because there's a nutrient in, in, in the gel, so, so you can keep it alive for a week or so. Um, single cells invade, and this may be a representation, what the biologists call a model of. The, um, of the brain itself. It has some problems, but it's OK. It, it gives us some idea of what's going on. And uh, let me just show you what happens. This is a time-lapse photograph taken by that, that uh, Japanese postdoc. Uh, and uh, here is, this is over 24 hours. And watch this guy. Um, see, it escaped. That's a little bugger that's going to cause the trouble. This one, too. Okay? They escape and they run away. Okay? And so what we under, we we're trying to, understand, trying to understand is how they do that. How, what's the mechanism by which they're actually crawling around? What, what, what's going on when they're moving? When they're moving in the brain tissue, and that's not so easy, as it turns out, for, to understand. It's not so easy, in some sense, for them to do. Now, we, uh, my experimental colleagues have a tool which they love, um, and we love the data, um, which comes out of it. It's called a confocal microscope, which is in which you scan various slices inside this transparent specimen so you get truly three-dimensional information. And the way it's done is you, you have the focus at a point, and all the, thing, all the, the light that, isn't, that doesn't come from that point um, is blocked by this, uh, this detector aperture and the, just a pinhole of light comes through. You can get about 70 microns, micron slices and, and very good one or two micron resolution in plane. So, so this is a very nice technique, very nice technique for finding things out. Um, often the cells that are, that are um, doing, the, that are down here are fluorescently labeled so that they glow and so we can watch them more easily. Now, right, so that's the technique, and here's the kind of thing you can get. Or let me just uh, talk about this technique versus other techniques. Uh, this is the bright, a bright field image of the type that I showed you. Uh, there's another thing you can do if you really want to, to find out 
what these cells are like, uh, say from the point of view of gen genetics. I'm not gonna talk about genomics, but people do, we do do that. Um, what my colleagues did is they froze the, they froze the, um, the gel and sliced it and then uh, used the laser capture techniques to pull some cells from here and some cells from here and try to figure out the genetic differences, the, 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 pho the phenotype differences between the, out the cells that are moving and cells that are inside, and they are different turns out, they are quite different. The, and also, the, for example, they proliferate less well, as I've already mentioned. And this is a, a, just a quick confocal uh, idea of what a confocal image is, and it's a 2D slice. Now, here is um, what we're after. We're trying, to, we're trying to figure out, we're trying to figure out what goes on, we're trying to figure out what goes on, at, uh, with these cells. And the first thing I'm gonna do is try to look at the cells one at a time. With this confocal microscopy, we can actually just look at them, okay? Now, physicists like that. You know, if you've ever been encountered with encountered physics, I mean, we're fascinated by things like billiard balls and <laughs> bullets and, you know, so forth. So these things are running around. Wow, that's our stuff. Okay, so let's, let's try to think about, let's try to think about uh, how these things move as single cells. And the second thing we're gonna do is talk about uh, what Fred mentioned, pattern formation, what the, a collection of cells do. And third, I'm going to talk about the, the jungle in which they move and how the cells affect the jungle, the, the extracellular matrix in which, which they live. Okay, so let's see what we can get. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is single cell motion. And so here are some tracks. And these are time-lapse confocal microscope pictures where we can actually track single cells. So we can identify these tracks. We can identify how things move on these tracks. And that's the idea. Um, and then we can see, get some idea about the dynamics, about the dynamics of these things moving. Here is uh, a nice three-dimensional picture which my student <coughs> cooked up. The, uh, the tumor sphoroid does not have latitude and longitude lines on it, but <laughs> it, allows you, it allows you to, um, uh, to visualize it as a sphere. It, it's pretty close to a sphere. And these tracks move out. Now, if you look carefully, you see that things come out of the equator and up so much out of the poles, that's because of complicated things involving with the way with the gel gels, and, and I'm not gonna talk about that. Mostly everything I'm gonna talk about is more or less in the equatorial plane. This is up and down, the gravity, okay? Somehow has, a, has, a, has an effect when the gel is solidifying, which we don't understand. Okay, so that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing we're gonna try to deal with. Well, um, now we come to this uh, dichotomy between physicists and basically everybody else. Um, what, does a, what, does, what have you learned, if you learned any biology, about cells? They're very complicated things. They have uh, membranes on the outside, they have nuclei inside, they have a cytoplasm, they have hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of important chemical reactions going on all the time, which uh, lead to different gene expression in their DNA and it leads to different chemical reactions. All kinds of things go on and that's what eventually leads to these philopods moving out and grabbing and you know, so inside the philopods are these wonderful things, you know, the tubule, microtubules which make the structure and act. I could go on, actually. Other people here could probably go on further. Um, this is a physicist's view of a cell. <laughs> it's a particle. Okay? And we know about particles. We know how they move. And um, so we're making this radical simplification. We're making this radical simplification of a very complex object. And the point is, what's the point of doing th something like that? The point of this is to try to, uh, to isolate the salient features of the motion. Out of those hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions that are going on, some are important for, for what we're interested in, some are not. And what we'd like to see is just exactly what is the salient feature? What's the, what's the thing that actually interests us? And we do that by simply looking from the outside in this, this uh, physics-based physics way to see, to see what is going on. Now, uh, if we can then try to go backwards, my friends in Arizona have their favorite genes, which they think um, are upregulated in the invasive cells and, get, and give rise to this extra invasion, okay? 
And so if you really understood that, you maybe you could disrupt that pathway. But our job as physicists is to see, see if that pathway is really upregulated. Now, um, I, this is a quote, this is not actually a quote from Einstein. This is said to be a quote from Einstein. Einstein said this much more in a much more complicated way. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the point. This is the point I want to make. Now, for one thing, he said it in German. Now, uh, now, um, uh, what happens? Well, you know, these these cells are in very complicated environment, and they're re receiving all kinds of rent, of clues, all kinds of clues of what they do. So the first thing you might guess is the clues are so complicated, arriving in, su in such complicated way that the motion is essentially random. Well, that's this is a case where in physics. The more complicated things are, the better they are. Because you can average over things, and you can talk about the motion as if it's purely random motion. And purely random motion is something that has been studied for a very long time by this fellow, that's Al Einstein, um, with his hair combed. When he was young, he was best. <laughs> When, this is 1905. When he was young, he was not at all what you, is the picture you have of him as a, he was a very natty dresser, for one thing. Uh, <coughs> this is random motion, random motion of uh, milk. This is diluted milk. And those milk particles are wandering around. This is called Brownian motion. In the way discovered by this guy, Robert Brown, a, a botanist, um, because they're being buffeted by atomic collisions. Okay? So that's, that's Brownian motion, purely random motion. Now, this is not what cells do. Bacteria are affected by Brownian motion. They're 10 times smaller than mammalian cells. But mammalian cells are too big to actually show any significant Brownian motion. However, these biochemical clues that they're getting and the clues from the environment that they're getting are sufficiently complicated that we believe that we can model them as if they were random motion. And we can hijack Einstein's theory to discuss, to discuss what they do. OK, so that's what we're going to do. Now, um, so. First question to ask is the cell in purely random motion. Now, you, I want you to remember the picture of the, the globe with the cells, uh, cells moving, and that's not what purely random motion is. Ran purely random motion would look like that. So cells are not in purely random motion. They're in random motion, but something is pushing them out. At least in some cases, they're pushing them away from the tumor spheroid. Okay? So we immediately light upon a biological problem we didn't know was there. Namely, what is the signal which says, go away? Okay? And that's by an analyzing the motion. So how do you analyze the motion? Well, this is the, the uh, work of a, a local hero. Um, George Uhlenbeck was one of the one of my predecessors in the department and one of the greatest uh, physicists who have ever been here. Um, <coughs> this is him at the time he did this work in 1930, or, or close to that time. Um, and he wrote down a way to analyze, which I'm not going to tell you in detail, using stochastic differential equations in our modern notation, um, to analyze the motion of a random walker subject to a force. Okay? And we have to think about the, a random walk is being, you know, walk is this way, a drunkard, you know. But our drunkards are on a hill. Yes, they're wandering around, but they tend to drift in a certain direction. That's the idea. That's the way we're going to model this cell motion. So, uh, and this was worked out by, the way to think about this, worked out by Uhlenbeck and uh, Ornstein. It's called the OU, Ornstein-Uhlenbeck process. And my student um, worked out uh, uh, an, uh, an OU model for the, the cell motion, and here is the experimental paths, and here are the simulated paths, and it works pretty well. And let me tell you what we th how we think this works. Let me tell you how this, we think this works. Well, um, here's this, here is the tumor spheroid, and here's the cell, and it's moving along, and, and this is a, sort of some representation of its path. And at any point on its path, we say it's moving out a certain amount and across a certain amount. Okay. And then what we can do is plot as a function of time the radial velocity and the angular velocity. So the function of time, the radial velocity you see here is quite large for a cell that's huge. Okay? 
And this particular cell line, after a day, it drops and it keeps on dropping. Whereas the angular motion is completely random. Okay? So that sort of validates. What was that? Anyway, that sort of verifies that we are doing something that is, um, is um, on the right track, and we can try to quantify the drop-off. We can try to tr quantify the drop-off of the um, velocity with, with time, and that's what we, I do here, and I won't go into details, but here is the function, as a function of time, is this radial velocity, and you see it gets very large at first, and then it drops off, and we're trying to figure out, why is that? What's going on? And that, it turns out, as we'll see later, depends on which kind of cell you're dealing with. Same tumor spheroid, you make a tumor spheroid with two different kinds of cells that are very closely related, and some of them go shooting out and keep on shooting out for a week, and some of them, like these ones, shoot out for a day and then sort of forget about it. Why is that? It turns out that the ones that shoot out for a day and then forget about it are the more malignant ones. I don't know why, but that's an interesting they're related to things that in, in human patients are more, more malignant. So maybe that'll give us a clue. Maybe that'll give us a clue of something going on. Okay, so that's single cell motion. That's the first approach. That's the first approach I wanted to take to these, um, these um, problems. And the thing that I wanted to emphasize, the thing I wanted to emphasize in this is that this um, approach has pointed us somewhere Namely, that this radial bias is flowing away from the tumor spheroid, which may be important, which may be important for uh, the cancer itself. It, you know, um, there's something that physicians know, which is sort of a peculiar fact, that taking out a tumor actually induces the growth of secondary tumors. Yeah. Okay, so it may be that, in this case at least, what's happening is these signals which say move get turned off, and they say, all right, we'll stop moving, we'll start growing, or something like that. Hmm? So, you know, we can get some clues which you might otherwise not get. Okay, so now I'm gonna turn to cell population dynamics. And um, here is the, the time course of these same experiments uh, over a week. So here is one cell line and moves up, you know, these cells are invading. Here's the other one, the one I've been showing you so, so far. This one, and look at the funny pattern. All streaky, this is not a mistake, this is not a bad photograph. These, these are real, and these little nodules may have something to do with secondary tumor formation, we don't know. Uh, but, um, so, but so there's a big difference, and what difference between these two cell lines is one mutation of the, <coughs> for the cognoscenti for, of the uh, EGF receptor. This is called delta EGFR. So the EGF receptor here is always turned on, and here it's, it, it only turns on when something's around. Now, okay, so what, you know, what can we make of that? I mean, we're physicists. We, we can look at the genetics, but, but not as well as the real experts, but what can we say? So what we do, you know, physicists not only know about single particles, we know about other things. We know about gases. Okay, so what are these, these cells? They're a gas of particles. And the gas of particles is flowing under the influence of this radial outward force and doing random motion. And we'd like to, to try to, de to describe, this, describe this gas of particles um, in some way. And the way we are gonna do it is using a formalism due to Marion von Schmolakowski, this guy, who was a contemporary of Einstein. Um, <coughs> and uh, better known to chemists than to physicists, he wrote, he wrote down something called the uh, Schmolakowski equation, which generalized Einstein's work. It is the, a population equa level equation which dis defines random walkers in, in, a, um, in a drift, with a drift, yes, the, the, the ones I talked about already, and uh, in, biologists call this the Keller-Siegel equation, which was introduced for studies of bacteria by these guys. Okay, so uh, I hesitated for a while before, you know, is it really a good idea to show a partial differential equation on Saturday morning? <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it's, you know, don't, you, you cannot look. 
<laughs> um, and uh, anyway, here, here is uh, the Schmalkowski equation in all its glory. Um, and the first term describes this motion, you know, this diffusion motion. And in our arcane symbols, I have a story about this equation in a moment. Uh, the, 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 in our arcane symbols, that's uh, the diffusion term. And then uh, we have to take into account the fact that the cells are moving out, and that's, this is a drift term. And um, then we have um, the fact that the radius itself is growing. I, I, you may have noticed that in the previous slide, that the, the tumor spheroid also grows. It ejects cells, but also grows. Hmm? Um, and so we have to take that into account. And that when it ejects cells, of course, it sheds them from the surface. because The surface of the tumor spheroid is growing. The inside is more or less dead, but the, uh, the surface is growing. And the, the tumors, the cells escape from the surface. OK, so that's uh, this term. And that's right here. And um, also, these cells out here proliferate. Not slowly, but they do proliferate. We've got to take that into account. So there are four things. And there are four terms in the equation. And I wrote down this equation, and we we're going to put it into a proposal. And my friend Nino, who is a very distinguished medical scientist, um, looked at this equation. He said, what is this? <laughs> and this is, you know, this is part of the problem when you're doing interdisciplinary work, is that you have to you know, explain arcane symbols like this one and this one. And um, he eventually he put it in as a graphic into you see it's just a picture, but never mind. Uh, we, uh, we did put it in and, and uh, went forward. But now the, um, but uh, my students and, and I were able, and, and our collaborators were able to get some interesting information out of this. Namely, we're able to predict various things and in terms of these four parameters. So this is once more this process, this process of boiling down, which is the specialist specialty of the physicist, boiling down to a few parameters, not 100,000 or more rate constants in these biochemical reactions, but just four. How fast do the cells proliferate when they get, when they get loose? How fast do they get loose? Um, how fast do they get pushed out? And how fast do they wander around? And that's all, OK? That's a complete description. Okay, so there are just four parameters, and we can fit them. And fitting them, we can look for the two cell lines and see that the delta EGFR, this is the radius, some sort of average radius of this, of this cloud of cells escaping, and it grows in time. And for this one, other one, it grows more quickly in time. And um, the, cell, the density in the cloud, we can also fit, goes like this, and this one even goes like this drops off more slowly. And from that, we can figure out some values of these parameters. And these values of these parameters are then, we find, for example, that the shed rate is significantly different for the two, two, two cell lines. And they differ only by the small amount. Why is that? Well, there's complicated things. One thing called cell-cell adhesion. Cells stick to each other. Presumably, when a cell gets loose, it has to get loose from the other cells. So it's a competition between cell-cell adhesion and this walking. You see, it's, it's grabbed onto the other guy and reaches out and grabs onto the fiber and pulls. And if it's really holding hard, it's not going to be able to get loose, yes? So that's, uh, that's the significance of that parameter. And that's something that you can do, you can look at biochemically, and presumably has something to do, something to do with the structure, with the structure of this uh, mutated cell line. With the fact that it's, uh, it has a high adhesion and uh, it, it, has, it actually has very little, very little of this bias motion. We don't have a clue about that. Okay, so this is what we can find out. We can find out that um, cells escape and there's random motion and they move away at this funny speed that we don't understand very well, at least for the ones that are eject, that have a large bias. Okay, um, now, Let's go on to, to an actual pattern formation problem. The actual pattern formation problem is why do you have sometimes this uniform pattern, sometimes you have this pattern? And we're going to try to relate that. We're going to try to relate that with what is going on, with what is going on, with presumably then could be related to what's going on biologically. Now, this could have something to do with cell-cell adhesion, but we're going to ignore that for what follows. 
we're going to just talk about, we're going to talk about the fact that these cells move out. And suppose they move out and they're proliferating and they proliferate more when they get more food and the food is what's making them move out. Then where they're getting more food, they're going to proliferate more so you can get spikes. Yes? And how do you, so you, right? You, you get more along some regions where you happen to have a little more food, you go that way. huh? And but um, if you have random motion, you can wipe, wipe that out because you're, you're, you're averaging back and forth, right? So there's a competition between two things. And by understanding the competition, maybe we can understand this pattern. And so this is, again, an example of using things that we know about. And this is in the case of we're do, doing things by the, about the physics of fluids. And fluids make patterns. If you've ever taken a fluid and put it between two pieces of glass and lifted up, everyone's done this. Right? You see these little fingers? These guys. Okay? That's called a growth instability. And growth instabilities is the kind of thing we can study. And if we could have the camera, I'm going to actually study it. I, I, um, I'm going to do a little experiment. This is an experiment which <clears throat> has, at first sight, nothing whatsoever, nothing whatsoever to do with um, with uh, cancer. This is a, a two plexiglass plates, <coughs> and um, right here, um, right here is a tube which goes in, and the tube is attached to a syringe, and I, so I'll be able to inject air. Hmm? And what's between the two plates is some glycerin, just, just some sticky fluid <coughs> colored with um, some sort of dye. And the idea, the question is, if I inject the air, what's going to happen? Well, you see, if I inject it very slowly, you just get a little uh, boring pattern. But if I inject it quickly, something quite different happens. OK? This is, goes by the unlikely name. I didn't make this up, viscous fingering. <laughs> and it has to do, it, is, it has a practical application in the physics of oil recovery. When oil prices go up, as we know something about that now, um, you can get more oil out of a field by injecting fluids into the field and pushing the oil towards the wells. But if you do that, what you get is this. And if the well is here, you're going to miss it. Right? So p this was actually discovered by both Safman and Taylor, physicists in Britain, and also people at Shell Research simultaneously in uh, Houston, because they were interested in these oil recovery. And that has something to do with cancer. Why do they have to, something to do with cancer? It's because these fingers arise for a reason. <coughs> and the reason is that near these tips, things can flow away more quickly, which is exactly mathematically analogous to the food coming in more quickly in our model. Yes. And so you get this inst unstable growth, but get the fingers growing at the expense of the things back here, which uh, don't grow because you can't get the fluid out of the way or you can't get the food in. Hmm? So that's the idea. And this is something that my postdoc and I uh, worked on. So here is um, our pattern, which is analogous to this pattern. You see it? Right here. And this is supposed to be related to this. And this is um, a uniform pattern. <clears throat> this is a uniform pattern. And it's supposed to be related to this. Now, if that's the case, we can understand what the various parameters are. Here is a case of small diffusion and large proliferation, as I've already said. Large diffusion, small proliferation. So something which is actually difficult to get at by direct biological experiments we can predict on the basis of this pattern. And that seems to work OK. And this kind of patterning, by the way, is, is, um, happens it on many scales for many, in many slightly different ways for cancer. You know, the word cancer means a crab. It corresponds to the, the shape of a tumor. And these it, tumors always grow unstably. Now, in, in the case of solid tumors growing unstably, not invasion, <clears throat> that's because of the same kind of growth instability, but it has to do with blood vessels coming in and feeding and feeding the, the, the tips better than the insides. 
So this kind of growth instability analysis has been used by other people to talk about the shapes of tumors before. Okay, now let's turn to the <clears throat> thing I haven't talked about is why are these cells fleeing? Why are these cells fleeing from the tumor spheroid? Why should they? Um, there are various reasons that you could imagine. One is the one I just talked about. Cells move towards a chemical concentration of some agent like a food or oxygen or some growth factor. Or they could be running away from what, some waste product excreted by the tumor. Okay, so the, the cells would move out. And this is a sort of standard thing. And in fact, it is known, <coughs> it is known that these cells are very chemotactic. They, they do respond to gradients of various chemicals. And you can see that in, in uh, laboratory experiments. Um, I'm going to argue that that's actually irrelevant for this experiment. Oddly enough, it's what we thought would happen. It's not what happened, or at least not important. And that's because of an experiment which this guy's name is David Vader. <laughs> um, uh, uh, which David, David did um, by accident. Uh, David is a physics graduate student at Harvard, one of my collaborators. And what he did was, it is very difficult to do, deal with these little tiny tumor spheroids. You can't see them. And um, they're a quarter of a millimeter across. Okay? <coughs> and what he did is he got two of them into the well instead of one. Okay? And he found uh, that here's one, here's the other. And what he found is that the cells, the green things, the fluorescently labeled cells, in fact, concentrate between the tumor spheroids. And that's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because if they were going for food, this is the place with the least food, because it's already been eaten. The food would be over here. Hmm? If it's running away from waste products, they'd be a maximum here. So, so they shouldn't be here. So what's going on? And that's what the red lines are. The red lines are the matrix. Those are the fibers of the matrix. And the fibers in the matrix are, in fact, gathered between, gathered between the two tumor spheroids, because the tumor spheroids are pulling are pulling on the matrix and straightening it out. And when it straightens it out, what we think is it makes a kind of highway that cells like go back and forth. And I'm going to try to understand that in what follows. So that's the third thing I wanted to talk about. The third thing I wanted to talk about in my physicist's approach, uh, we're going to try to figure out the interaction of the cells with the extracellular matrix. and. Once more, I rub my hands. Wow, this is a physics, this is mechanics, OK? We're in stress and strain and bending and pulling, right? We know, we know how to do that. I mean, of course, there are other things about this cancer which I don't know how to do. So, But anyway, this is what we can bring, what we can bring. So um, here is uh, the matrix. And we're trying to figure out the matrix is a tangled net of polymers, which is called the gel. Now this gel, the one we work with, not the brain, but the one we work with is a gel which in the slightly different form is very familiar to everyone. It's, it's exactly the same as Jell-O. Okay? Those cells are put into something which is just like the Jell-O you eat. It's what Jell-O used to be. It used to be made out of collagen one, and it's <clears throat> now made out of some, something else. But um, anyway, that's what we use. Uh, and the, what happens is the cells can pull the, on, the, on the matrix, the matrix can deform this, can impede the cells, and we're trying to figure that out. OK, so remember I said it, it's, these cells are wandering in a jungle. Here is the jungle that they're going in. This is a, a micrograph of collagen one, which we get from the tails of cows. And um, it is um, mostly collagen one. There's some, a little bit of another polymer. And I'll talk about collagen one, just what is that? Um, in a minute. And uh, the thing I want you to want to point out is there is a sort of typical size of the holes in here. That is 10 times smaller than the size of the cells. And they have to get through that. So you're threading your way through this dense jungle, pulling by, by climbing on fibers. And it's in three dimensions. Okay, That's how a cell moves. Hmm? So how, do, how does it do that? Well, let's try to understand. Here is. One thing it could do is eat up the eat up the matrix, and that does happen. People who are experts know about this. This is called the secretion of proteases. It doesn't seem to be important in our experiment, and the cells can deform the matrix, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. 
Um, here is the matrix in a confocal micro microscope picture. And you can see that it's all tangled and random and complicated. And this is the thing that the cells move in. And so how do we think about this? How do we think about this? This is Dave Vader and my colleague Dave. Uh, all these guys are both at Harvard. I have worked, worked this out. So how do they do this? Well, the cells, uh, if this was a very rigid structure, there would be nothing to talk about. It would be a geometry problem. The cell would just have to find a way. But that's not, not the case. What happens is that the cell, whoops, the cell, in fact, is pretty strong. It can pull. It can pull on that matrix and make it, look, look at these alignments, these alignments it can make. So the cells are strong, and they can deform the matrix in a big way. And let me show you how the matrix can be deformed. So uh, the same group at Harvard took a picture. Here's the tumor story. There's some cells up here. And you see these basically straight lines here. And out here, it gets random. Hmm? And I'll show you another picture. Um, over a larger scale, you see the, 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 there's fewer fibers here. There are many fibers here. And look at out here, it gets random. Okay, So this highway move, uh, extends over a certain distance, which we don't understand. I have a student working on that. How, how can you understand how big this, you know, how long this highway is? Does this highway actually provide pathways for cells? And how do they, how do, they do it? Well, OK, so we made a start at that. And uh, so the, I've already said all these things. Um, we still don't know why the cells move out rather than out and in at random, but that's a less pr hard problem than the fact that they're directed along radial paths. Hmm? They do, in fact, sometimes go out and sometimes go in. Hmm? But they mostly go out. And that's a, that's, but that's a smaller problem than the fact that they don't, it's hard for them to get across because they're crawling on the, you know, they're climbing these parallel ropes. Hmm? So that's the idea. OK, so we're trying to understand the collagen medium. Well, here's collagen. Collagen is we are starting with the chemical level. It is, you have three polymer chains, and it gets wound up, and then it gets wound up into this huge thing. This is hundreds of polymer chains, a very stiff, on the, on the molecular scale, a very stiff kind of thing. You should think of it as not as you might think of a usual polymer. You should think of it as a, as a kind of thing which is just a bendy, a bendy beam. Yes? OK? And the beams are connected together at points which we call crosslinks. Whoops. And the, the, these are the crosslinks. Okay. So this is the way I think about it. Now, OK, so let's see how we think about it as physicists. Well, how do we do that? Well, uh, oh, yeah. Um, one more thing is this is an experiment that we can all do. There is a fact about these polymers, about these gels, which is interesting. Collagen is very common. Okay? You have it right here. Okay? This is, your, your skin is, is, is collagen. And I know if you take on your, tug on your earlobe just a little bit, you'll find it's kind of easy to tug. But if you pull hard, it gets very stiff. Okay? It is not elastic. It doesn't just pull. It gets very it's an elastic, a nonlinear elastic sp spring. It gets harder to pull if you pull it out. Okay? That's going to become important in, in a moment. Um, and this is, in a more dignified experiment, showed you, <laughs> <laughs> shows you this, this uh, behavior. Um, this is uh, the original elastic behavior. And then there's this second uh, period, second region, and this second region is called uh, the shear, this, this shear stiffening region. And we're going to try to understand that. And why are we going to try to understand that? Well, it's interesting in itself because lots of things do this. But it's also interesting because it'll give us a clue about the cell motion. Hmm? So let's see if we can do that. All right. So how do we deal with the collagen matrix? Well, they're beams. Okay, Everybody knows how to deal with beams. You go back to Lenny Euler and Danny Bernoulli, 1750, did the classic theory of beams. And this was, a, this was a, um, an important advance for mathematicians. Engineers did not pay attention until the construction. I, I just found this out. It's absolutely remarkable. 
The first time this theory was used, which tells you how strong a beam is, yes? You would think everyone would want to know that if you're building a building. Um, it was first used by Eiffel in, when building the Eiffel Tower in 1889, 130 odd, you know, 29 years later. Um, so, all right, what? All right, so, but there's, a, there's an equation, which is the Euler Bernoulli equation, which we use. And then we have these cross links, okay, which uh, tell you how the fibers are joined together so it makes a gel. And we just assume the fibers uh, are joined together by, sprint, by <coughs> an elastic join you know, that there's, they can bend. Very little is known. Very little is known about this, uh, cross, these cross links. So uh, once more, I want to have my two views. Um, how does a uh, medical scientist or anyone sensible look at the brain? Well, here's how. It's a very complicated thing. Okay. Uh, there's one of these. Well, anyway, the the tumors that I'm talking about grow in this region and uh, various places. And uh, this is uh, so. This is how a uh, Doctor looks at the brain. This is how a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> this is what a brain is for the physicist. It's beams. It's beams. So, um, all right, so what do we do? The first thing we need to know is <coughs> that the Eiffel Tower is a very complicated construction. And so is that gel, and we need to know it in order to get a good model. So what Andy uh, Stein did, uh, and in this, this paper, which is coming out soon, <coughs> we figured out a way to extract the network from confocal microscope pictures, which isn't so easy, even if we have three-dimensional information. This is what a picture looks like, and this is what the network looks like. And it's not so easy, but we did figure out how to do it. OK, so here's our model. We have beams, and we have crosslinks, and we have these beams are elastic, and we put them between two, <coughs> two walls and we pull, and we have the walls pulled out, and then we try to see how the, uh, how the beams move. Okay, so that, that's a physics uh, problem, which a micromechanics problem, which we can do, and here's the answer. Okay, so here is how this looks. We pull out on these, pull out on these fibers, and they straighten out. And what we can show, and I'm not going to go into detail, <coughs> is that that nonlinear part of the curve of the stress versus strain, the, you know, the, the hardening of the, uh, it corresponds to straightening out, corresponds to straightening out the network. You start out with the network all turned up like this, yes? And then when you pull on it, there are other beams on each side, they straighten out. And then what you're trying to do is stretch these things. And of course, that's very hard. So it gets much stiffer as it pulls out. And this is a typical behavior, typical behavior of a gel. And this is, this is in, the, in this case, shown to be shown explicitly. So the stiffening is related to the formation of the highways. And so here <coughs> are some results of modeling. When we pull things out, they, they straighten out. And um, we can uh, fit the stress-strain relation, and we can say some things that are interesting. So here's what my student did, is he actually took a model, a, a realistic model for two tumor spheroids, and see, see if you get significant straightening of the fibers between them, and you do. And now we're looking and see if there are holes in there that, we, that cells can move along. And so we get some idea, get some idea of this directed motility this directed motility, which is presumably important, presumably important for um, the uh, motion of the cells. So that's the kind of story we want to, I wanted to tell you. This is the, um, the idea. We are interested in glioma, invasion, explicitly invasion. We claim that we can understand the invasion, presumably in a, in a, in a general bi uh, biological context. You can understand invasive processes, which <coughs> occur in other contexts too, by biased random walks of cells. 
um, a long sort of pattern, they have patterns, and the cell matrix interactions are important. Now, as I say, this is not confined to glioma. Um, this is, some, I'm just speculating about something, but something that I know about, which we have not followed up, which, which is interesting. In breast cancer, you have invasion, too. And in certain kinds of breast cancer, you have something which is known to the experts as Indian file or single file invasion, where you see, you, if you look on a, um, on, on a histological specimen of, of breast cancer, you, you will see the edge of the tumor and cells moving out literally in single file, one after another, in lines, okay? And so this is presumably a very, very strong uh, example, very strong example of this kind of um, cell matrix interaction, I believe. Anyway, we, it, it, it could be. It could be that the, the matrix near the tumor is being stretched in the same way and you're getting this single cell invasion along lines. Uh, I have not followed that up. That's just a, a speculation. Okay, so cells deform the matrix, and these are part of a, the complete, complete picture of invasion which we'd like to give, um, which other people will have, you know, biochemistry, pharmacological approaches to this, of course, are the, the main thing that has to be done, but we hope to give some insight into how, how to deal with it. And I wanted to end up with a, um, I've been quoting scholarly journals, I wanted to quote another journal, uh, this is last week's Economist, which has a, uh, a very nice article about cancer stem, stem cells that I, that I uh, mentioned in passing. Uh, you probably thought that you could avoid hearing about her this morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, and this is the, the I, I agree with the journalist who wrote this. In science, you never know where the answer is coming from. Thank you for your attention. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.